All right, well, it's important to have a watch, otherwise I won't know. And, and the reason it's important to have a watch is because last night, right around, I don't know, was it 2, 3 o'clock? And I know because I looked, is, is the rain woke me up. <laughs> Did the rain wake you up? Yeah, some of you? No, you slept right through? Well, um, this is the second time in a row, second Sunday in a row, when we have lots of rain, right? You guys get wet last week. Yeah, I did too. And I uh, hope you all stay dry this morning. Uh, but, you know, the Bible speaks very positively of rain. Did you know that? Uh, it says that rain is a sign of God's testimony. Apostle Paul himself said the following, He, meaning God, has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. So, friends, don't be too upset with the rain. Uh, but you made it here. That's fantastic. By the way, if you're watching this via the YouTube uh, channel, um, it's not sure if it's raining where you are, but rain is good. Well, friends, we are now in the middle of the book of Acts. And for the last four months, we've been diligently going through it chapter by chapter and looking into the biblical text. And at this half Point, friends, at this half point, I, I hope that you are beginning to see a pattern that emerges as the apostles and the early church uh, members live out their faith. And what I noticed, what I noticed as part of this pattern was that Christian life in this early church was not cushy. It wasn't comfy. I know you're sitting in very nice cushy chairs and comfy chairs, better than, I was told, better than the wooden benches we used to sit on. However, the Christian life is not cushy. It is not comfy. There was change in uh, the early church. There was ups filled with joy. And then there was downs filled with persecution. And interestingly enough, friends, interestingly enough, even in the downs, uh, we see some apostles still filled with joy. Imagine that. But the pattern, the pattern that we see goes something like this. There's an opportunity to share the word of God with, and the good news uh, of forgiveness. And, and we see uh, uh, restored relationships with God. But then uh, we see the message being received with mixed results. Some accept it and become followers of Jesus, while others reject it and begin to oppose it. The new followers of Jesus begin to learn and practice what Jesus taught. Those who reject the message begin to stir up trouble. They stir up trouble for those who had accepted this message. And often this escalated into full-blown open persecution. To escape persecution, the church members uproot their families. They uproot their families and they relocate to a new place. When they get to the new place, of course, the cycle begins again. They have opportunity to share the word, and persecution starts. So in the early church, we see the Christian life is not stable. It's not tranquil. It is not what we would call the suburban Christian life, but rather it is a state of flux with husbands and wives, boys and girls, men and women of all ages, experiencing disruption in experiencing adjustment. Paul and Barnabas, in the last few chapters that we've read so far, have gone over uh, this over and over and experienced a similar pattern. And I'd like you to notice it again as we look at Acts chapter 14. So go ahead and open Acts chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, bring them out if you can. If not, um, that's okay. You can just listen. But we're going to start reading Acts chapter 14. 14, uh, right in the beginning, right verse 1. Okay, Acts chapter 14, here it goes. It says, in Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Remember, Greeks is not necessarily Greek ethnicity, but non-Jews. Uh, but the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people, the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the, give me one second, 
some cited with I love electronic Bibles. Here we go. Some, uh, some, um, some cited with uh, uh, Jews, but um, here we go. Others with the apostles. There was verse 5. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country. There they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystria, there sat a man who was lame. He had been there uh, that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Now, Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet! At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul, they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crown, crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, what are you doing this? We too are humans like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their way. Yet he has not let himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. And won the crowd over. I wonder how long it took them to do that. They stoned Paul. I wonder how long it took them to do that. And they dragged him outside the city. Thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he... <laughs> he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystria, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with fasting and prayer committing them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for their work had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Let's pray. Father, may your message, may your good news of reconciliation be clear this morning. Holy Spirit, please speak through my heart and my mind and the words that I'm about to speak out. May they be your words, not mine. May we be transformed to be more like Christ. I pray this in his name and for his merits, not mine. Amen. So as I finished reading this text, did you notice the pattern? Did you notice how you see difficulties with Paul and Barnabas. 
Did you see what they have to face? I think it's important to understand and observe what they had gone through. How were they? How were their lives disrupted? How were their lives impacted? And how did God help them to adjust and thrive? This morning, I'll highlight three things that happened to them, but there's many others, many others. By the way, friends, don't let Sunday morning message be the only spiritual food you receive because in your week, if it's the only thing, I'll tell you that, that you're likely to starve. So spend time and understand what the Word is saying throughout the week. You need to study, read, practice the Word of God during the week. Spiritual growth is directly impacted by a life of obedience. So here we go. Let's see what these three things are. But again, remember, there's many others that I'm going to encourage you to look for and see if you can digest for yourself. Here's the disruptors. I'm convinced, by the way, that you and I face the same kinds of disruptions and face the same kinds of challenges. Here's the first one. The first one is when faced with poisoning of the mind, Paul and Barnabas showed persistence. Paul and Barnabas faced poisoning of the minds, and when they had faced that, they showed persistence. Uh, there's a pattern of this kind of poisoning of the mind, by the way. We see it in the previous chapter, chapter 13, verse, verse 8, when uh, Elimus, who was, was trying to persuade the Roman proconsul away from God's word, and, and he, who was a sorcerer, the, the Elimus, he was a deceiver, and I can imagine him whispering lies and innuendos and finding clever ways to paint the appointed servants of God in a negative light. But Paul and the Lord dealt with him. Uh, last week also we saw verse 14, uh, 13, no, I'm sorry, verse 50 in chapter 13 where the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing prominent women to oppose the servants of God. Friends, these are not like the sorcerer. These are Within the family of God, these are the people of God. These are the people that God chose to say, you are my people. And they're the ones causing and stirring trouble. You know, I wonder how they did it. I, 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 how were they successful? How were they so successful? Were they aggressive? Did they aggressively and openly uh, be, uh, were they belligerent? Or was it more passive-aggressive and subversive? The text does not share these details with us, but we do have a glimpse of how poison can be disseminated among God's people. First, let me take you to Genesis. In Genesis, when the tempter came to Eve, it was not a direct, aggressive attack. But it was rather subtle. It was rather helpful in attitude. I mean, the tempter only wanted to help, right? He just wanted to understand, right? I mean, the tempter said, did God really say that you can't eat any fruit of the tree? Really? Is that what God said? I mean, do you really think he didn't know? Now, of course, Eve answered correctly, and she's, you know, she said, no, 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 of course, we can eat anything except that one over there. But the tempter continued to poison her mind. And no, 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 that's, that's not right. You won't die. I, can't, I, I can imagine him trying to be so ever, ever so helpful to Eve. Eve, I just want you to grow as a human being. I, I, I just want to help you clarify God's intent. Surely, Eve, you're not going to die. You're just not growing enough. Eve, you ought to grow more. You ought to be like God. And there she is, listening to this poison. Eve, you need to take matters into your own hands. And Adam and Eve, their minds got poison. Second, we actually see in the New Testament, we see it in Matthew chapter 4. Here we see how poison can be administered not just 
to God's people, but actually by using the word of God. Friends, <laughs> do you hear what I said? This is poison that was administered using the scriptures. This is serious and dangerous stuff. Matthew 4 shows us it's not only possible, but it can be highly effective. Especially for those who don't have a strong faith. In Matthew, we see our Lord Jesus being tempted with such poisons. It's done with innuendos, with crafty questions, and with the words of the scripture. Matthew 6 says, the the tempter came to Jesus. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. Here's the devil quoting scripture. It is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And you know what? The devil is 99% correct here. That is true. That, that is in the scripture. He had the most effective, foolproof verse to show the Lord. Look, I have it right here. It says in the scripture, you ought to do this. Poison works like that, friends. Poison works like that. This is where we need the humility. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas faced people with minds that had poisoned, have been poisoned. What do they do? Well, one thing you can do with people with poisoned minds, you can go after them and say, whack them. <laughs> Let's whack these people. Get them out of here. I don't think that's what they did. They persisted. They kept going and going and going. First, they took their time. They took their time. They were not in a rush. In uh, Iconium, uh, we read that Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace and enabled them to perform signs and miracles and wonders. Second, they continued to preach. Preach. So they took their time. They were not in a hurry. And, and then they continued to preach. They never gave up. You preach and preach and preach. Verse 7 in Acts 14. They fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystria and Derbe, where they continued to preach the gospel. They were undeterred. There's a perseverance here. Have you considered what poison looks like in this instance? I mean, he could have, right? I mean, here he is having trouble over and over and over and over. Have you considered what poison might look like, Paul? <coughs> Try this. See if this fits. Uh, hey, Paul, you have all these setbacks. Maybe God is trying to tell you something. Or, hey, Paul, why do you think you keep having these obstacles in your way? Are you sure this is God's path for you? You've already been kicked out of several cities. Maybe you ought to give up. Maybe God is sending you a message and you're not listening. Paul practiced perseverance. So what about us? How do we practice perseverance? How do you do it? Well, I'll tell you what I do. And if it's helpful to you, take it with you. Or at least take some parts of this with you. I'll tell you what I do. When I face some kind of question, some kind of poison that comes my way, I remember my calling. See, I believe Paul and Barnabas did the same thing. That's my guess, by the way. It's not in the text. It's a personal guess. You see, Paul and Barnabas were set apart for God's work. It happened in the beginning of the previous chapter. God said, the, the Holy Spirit said, set this people apart. There are those discouraging days, and when those days come, our opposer comes with poisonous thoughts. Maybe you're not good enough. Maybe the music is not good enough. Maybe the preaching is not good enough. Maybe our treats are not good enough. Maybe the coffee is horrible. Maybe the high school is too far. Maybe the chairs are too comfortable. Maybe you're an addict. Maybe you are just... Maybe, and maybe, and maybe, and maybe, and maybe. What are those questions in your mind? What are those tapes that keep on playing? Why do you go to church? 
Maybe you ought to stay home. It's more comfy. See, those is what the opposer wants you to think. But God says to you, I love you with an everlasting love. I traversed time and space to be with you. I experienced the more horrific separation on the cross so that you don't have to. You are called. You are called. You are mine. You are called to be my, my people, my loved one, my family. You are mine, and I love you. Jesus loves you. So I remember my calling. Second, I focus on the next step, not the entire journey. See, the journey can be overwhelming. When I think of the journey, like, oh my goodness, oh, I don't. Whew. People say, take it a day at a time. That's good. Take it a day at a time. But you know what? Maybe you have to take it an hour at a time. Maybe half an hour at a time. So I don't know what you're going through, and I don't, I don't know what voices and what poison you're facing, but if you need to take it a day, an hour at a time, do so. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has its own trouble. The third is I stay with my companion. See, but Paul and Barnabas left together. They were together. When Paul was being stoned in our text and left for dead, Barnabas didn't take off. The Lord has put people in your life and in my life who is your companion. It could be your spouse. Jenny is such a good companion to me. It, it could be a friend, a parent. It could be a church. <laughs> By the way, friends, if you are here this morning physically, agape is your companion. It's okay. You, you are not alone in this. Remember your calling or who called you. Remember to take it one step at a time. You may not be able to skip and jump and run, but you can plod. And stay with those who care about you. Look around. We might be small, but we're strong in the Lord. The second thing. So in addition to the poisoned minds that they faced, when faced with hopelessness, Paul and Barnabas showed healing. When faced with hopelessness, Paul and Barnabas showed healing. In our text, uh, Paul saw the crippled man had faith to be healed. He saw that he had faith to be healed. I, I, friends, I have absolutely no idea what he saw. I have no idea. And I've been wrecking my brain. What did he see? But clearly the text says, Paul saw that this guy had faith. What does that look like? Uh, in this chapter, when he's preaching, he sees the fellow that never walked. And he looked directly at him. Paul saw that the man had faith to be healed. So he did what he saw Jesus do. Right? Paul is a follower of Jesus. So Paul now does what Jesus did. And... He said, he called out, stand up on your feet. <laughs> and then the man did what he was told. He jumped up and began to walk. What? What does healing look like in your context? Where you live, where you work, where you go to school, where you shop, where you play, where you go take a walk. What does healing look like? What does healing look like in your context? You're not sure? No problem. Uh, maybe we take it one step at a time. Start by the identifying the hopeless situations near you. What are those impossible situations that seem unsolvable that you are facing today? This week I got a call from Amanda. Uh, because she was facing one of those impossible situations. And I asked her if she would be willing to share. So, Amanda, why don't you come up, please? Um, and, and grab that mic over there. Um, you can probably use those stairs and come around. Uh, yeah, yeah, just come up here. People want to see you, you know. Yeah, bring, bring that mic with you. Uh, uh, friends, th th I know Amanda's not the only one that faced impossible 
situations. I know for a fact that there's other hopeless situations this week. Have you seen them around you, by the way? Have you seen the hopeless situations near you? If you haven't, start by seeing them. Start by noticing them. Start like Paul did. Look directly at the hopeless situation. Have you noticed how hard it is to notice? Have you noticed how hard it is to look at a hopeless situation? Start by looking at them first. So, um, Amanda, tell me what happened this week. Are you, are you all mic'd? Yeah, come, come, cl- no. come closer to me. Come closer to me. Yeah, you, it's on. It's, it's on? on, yeah. It's on, fantastic. So, right. you gave me a call. Yes. And what did you tell me? So, on Monday, many of you know because you're on Facebook, my mom um, woke up with chest pain. And my mom's kind of stubborn, so she decided to go to work and not go to the hospital. Um, ends up calling me after work saying she's going to the hospital and we find out that she had a minor heart attack. Yeah, and which, quite honestly, some of you have been praying yes. for that situation because I saw on social media your interactions with, with Amanda. So you know a little bit about the history, at least some of you do. Yes. So she had a minor heart attack. They did all the tests, the blood work, the scans, all that stuff. And um, her blood work was le- elevated, so they realized that her heart had some trauma to it. So that's when they decided that she had a heart attack. So, of course, we were all a little bit shocked because, well, I mean, she worked and went about her day like nothing was wrong and apparently had a heart attack. But my mom is 67 and has been smoking heavily cigarettes for most of her life. And she quit when she had her knee replacement and then picked it back up again. So, of course, everyone was a little bit mad at her for sure. picking that up again and the doctor was very much like you need to quit and right now after all this happened she, you know she was brought to the hospital correct yes. and the doctor said all right we got a problem here we need to put some yep. intervention in here yep. so they went wanted to do a catheter where they went in through the arm with the camera to see uh, if there's any blockage in her heart put a stint in all that kind of stuff and the pres- and by the way, these procedures nowadays are quote unquote routine. But yes. let me tell you, there's nothing routine about this. Yeah. We're, we're, we're touching the hearts here. You know, this it, medical miracles are fantastic, but this is still a very challenging situation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they said she'd be in for about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, nurse came back to tell us that everything was fine. And we're like, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's great news. Routine, right? right? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we went back to her room and we waited for the surgeon to come in. And the surgeon just like, I mean, he had, like, this look on his face, which was kind of, you know, I mean, I'm a believer. My mom is a strong believer, so we were both kind of like, yeah, come on, tell us what's going on. Um, but he said that he went in, and in, like, all of his career, he has never seen anything like this. My mom's arteries around her heart, um, none of them were blocked, but he said that they, her heart was, like, that of a child's heart, and that it was, like, like immaculate, right? Like so, super healthy. Like super healthy, and she's 67 and a heavy smoker, so he was just completely dumbfounded. And my mom told me a couple of days ago after I talked to you that she, you know, they're like awake. You're awake during that procedure a little bit. She said that she could hear the doctor being like, like he looked at the camera and was like, no, this is impossible. Like, this is impossible. And then he gathered all the nurses around, and my mom's like, well, what's going on? Obviously, that's good news. He's like, I should write a paper about you. Like, he couldn't explain it. And of course, my mom obviously was like, I can tell you what it was. You know? <laughs> Amen. So. Thank you, Amanda, for yeah, sharing that story. What a, what a fantastic. You can bring that mic down and put it. Thank you for, yeah. for that. And friends, I, I hope you get to see there's impossible situations that all of you face. And, and we face, and yet God works into these. Because I'll tell you, when Amanda called me, I had one of those days. And I needed to hear that. And, and it's wonderful how in those impossible situations, God shows up. God shows up. But it starts with a clear decision to stare at the impossible situation, at that hopeless situation, to stare at it. Look directly at it. When I travel downtown Milwaukee, I find it so 
difficult and so uncomfortable for me to pass and drive by the homeless people there. And it's hard, and I used to just avert my eyes. And I'm just like, okay, just don't look at them, just don't look at them. Just... I don't think that's what the Lord wants us to do. By the way, at our worship service in three weeks, we're going to tackle the impossible situation of homelessness in Milwaukee. We're going to tackle this. They sound like, Pastor, what are you talking about? You're a tiny little church. What can you do? You know what? We can do what we can do. And if we are faithful into what the Lord is calling us to do, we are not the only Christians in the city. We are not the only Christians in the world. The Holy Spirit will marshal the right forces. So what will we do? Well, first of all, this is a gigantic problem. Are we going to solve it? I don't know. May we? Lord, bless us to do so. But we will take this one step at a time. Come with us. Come on this adventure. Uh, come and see. Come and be transformed. Come and experience healing, not just for those that we help, but for those for yourself. Come and experience uh, when you practice obedience, when you do what Jesus did, you will experience growth. You will experience beyond just learning new juicy spiritual concept. You will practice what you already know. By the way, I'm not asking you to go downtown Milwaukee and do stuff. We're going to do, we're going to impact homelessness right here in this location. We will impact homelessness in Milwaukee by gathering here in Pewaukee and doing uh, blankets and also we'll be doing sandwiches and then we're going to partner with other people. We're going to partner with another organization to bring healing. Friends, we have to practice healing. When we see, when we are faced with a hopeless situation, we ought to do what our Lord did and that is practice healing. So friends, practice healing in your own context. Whatever that might look like. No, I'm not asking you to, to go around and shout things to people to get up because they're sick. Or, no, no, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you for you to see the problem. And I'm asking you to say, Lord, how will you use me in my own context to bring healing to one person, to one neighborhood? And friends, let's do it together. You're not alone. That's how we do the acts of kindness. That's how we worship the Lord. There's a third thing that we faced. And of course, my enemy, my watch, is telling me that I'm out of time. But I do want to share with you the third thing. That when they faced retribution, Paul and Barnabas showed resilience. Resilience in the face of retribution. Resilience. That means they were not easily offended and Paul was most definitely offended. Verse 19 tells us that they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. Yes, he was offended. There was an offense committed. Have you been offended? Have you been offended? Probably not like Paul was. But do you have resilience? Do you have resilience? Maybe in our lives we ought to toughen up a bit. Maybe we ought to have a bit of resilience. I'll tell you, I need resilience. Why? Sometimes I say stupid things. And then the devil comes and says, oh, you should have said this, or you should have done that. I'm like, you know what? It's gone, done. I need to have a bit of resilience. So do you. You're in ministry. That's why we call all the people, all our members at Agape, we call them ministry partners. You're Christians. Have some resilience. That's unlikely to do things perfect all the time. So why beat yourselves up? A simple, I'm sorry, when things need to be said, I'm sorry. But otherwise, a bit of resilience. See, in verse 22, Paul reminded his listeners, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom. Now, I do have to make a little tangent here. This does not mean that we have to do all the suffering for God to accept us. 
Now, some have looked at this passage and some of this verse and went in that direction. But I don't think that's the intent. Because, see, already Jesus preached about the kingdom of God being near and them being in it. Even before the suffering. Meaning, the kingdom of God is here. And, you know, friends, the kingdom is a little bit like that. It's a lot like that. There's a here and now component. We are part of the kingdom of God now. You, if you believe in Christ, are part of the kingdom. And yet there's a kingdom is coming component. When Jesus returns in his kingdom, it will be fully manifested. That's why when we take communion, I love to end with until he returns. Until he returns. There's that hope of the kingdom is coming. See, when we die, or when Jesus comes back, uh, he promises that he will take us into his realm, into his kingdom. So quite honestly, what Paul is really saying here is that in, when we are involved in the mission of God, uh, by the way, remember, to be involved in the mission of God means that you are involved with poisoned minds, you are involved with hopelessness, and you're going to face all sorts of retributions. So friends, when we face these, in order to face these, we need resilience. And Paul did something practical to assure resilience. He did something very tangible. He appointed elders. Now, no, they were not elected as a congregation, a congregational vote. All right, let's put it to a vote. Who wants Joey? Who wants Mary? No, he appointed them. Interestingly enough, and by the way, at Agape, our elders serve on what we call the shepherding committee. Tom has been serving faithfully in this capacity. We have two other pastors that are not part of this congregation that have been serving faithfully in that, con- in that capacity. Uh, by the way, Colleen has been nominated to be on the shepherding committee. So Colleen is traveling right now. If, you know, when you see her, it's like, oh, she's been nominated to be part of the shepherding committee. It is something practical. Resilience. Resilience with healing and persistence. So what's the bottom line, friends? What's the bottom line? Well, bottom line is what I said earlier. Christian life is not cushy. It's not comfy. It involves changes. It involves disruptions. It involves persecutions. Indeed, a spiritual war. And you're in it. And like all wars, friend, it has casualties and even friendly fire. We must be ready for the long haul, for the marathon. And I don't know if you've ever done a marathon, but it's going and going. Uh, one of the, you guys know that, that my family and I love um, uh, movies and love the nerd movies, Marvel movies. Captain America's iconic line is, I can do this all day. <laughs> now, it started with him when he was younger and scrawny looking. He was being bullied and being beat up. Beat, he was getting beat up. And, and, and he, he, w- he wasn't ready to give up. He, he wasn't ready to, to just say, yeah, I'm going to. No, he's like, you know what? I'm going to get up and I can do this all day. I can outlast you, you bully. I can do this all day. Yes. We're facing challenges, we're facing pain, but we can do this all day. No, not like Captain America in our own strength, because I don't know about you, but I'm not that strong. But the Holy Spirit enables us to face all sorts. We can do this all day. You're facing trouble, you've been beaten down, you made some mistakes, get up. You can do this all day. You're facing impossible situations. You are facing uh, hopeless situations. Get up. God's mercies are new every morning. You can't do this all day. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is. He's the boss. He's the king. He's the king of kings. And he sends the Holy Spirit. So, little church... (laughs) Little agape, (laughs) take heart. 
Jesus said to his small of disciples, his small band of disciples, he said to them, in this life, you will have trouble. You're going to have it. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Persistence, healing, resilience. And that, my friends, is what we face in our Christian life of great expectations. God is good. God is good. Let's pray together. Lord, give us the eyes to see the hopelessness. Give us the courage to stare it in the face. Give us the stamina to be persistent and to have that persistency. Lord, toughen us up in your strength that we may have the resilience of keeping going and running the good race, running the marathon. And Holy Spirit enables us to do so. For we pray in Christ's name. And we do so with your help, Holy Spirit. Bring these prayers to the throne of the Lord, to the throne of God. And may we be found faithful until the King returns. Amen. Friends, I hope you have been blessed this morning and it sense the, the, the movement of the Spirit. Let's stand together and let's read the benediction. Again, this is the benediction that you are blessing each other with. And let's read together. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, and love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Have a good Sunday and good rest of the week.